can't even remember the title myself at this moment. <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, let's let's pray. We'll pray for Salt Mine briefly, and then we'll pray for Derek, and then Di will come up to read, and it's then straight into the Bible reading. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you again for your mercy, which has preserved us to this morning. We thank you that your mercy is anew every morning. That uh, whatever our condition this morning, we we must say that you are good to us that you are gracious to us and that you are loving to us and Lord we thank you for the for the privilege of, of hearing about salt mine this morning and for the work that they're doing Lord we thank you for Dave Pope and the others who are involved in this great work and we pray your blessing upon them we pray Lord that uh, that this week will be a, a, a means of, of stirring up our interest not only in salt mine but in reaching out into our communities and way beyond with the good news of Jesus. And we thank you again this morning for Derek and for his gifts. And we pray very particularly for him, Lord, with this cold. Lord, uh, we, we pray that, uh, that in his weakness this morning, he will know your strength and your power lifting him up. Anoint him, we pray, by your, with your spirit and give him the strength to open this glorious word of yours to us this morning. Lord, we just lift him to you. And we pray now that as we listen to your word being read to us, that our ears will be open and our hearts receptive to the truth, the glorious truth which you have for us today. Lord, hear us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Colossians chapter 2 and beginning to read at verse 6. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. In him you were also circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature, not with a circumcision done by human hands, but with the circumcision done by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God, who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us, He took it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you for the prize. Such people go into great detail about what they have seen and their spiritual minds puff them up with idle notions. They have lost connection with the head from the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. Since you died with Christ to the basic principles of this world, why, as though you still belong to it, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These are all destined to perish with use because they are based on human commands and teachings. 
such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. Some of you will know the name of Leroy Imes, the veteran navigator worker. And he was in Florida one day, and don't we all wish we were in Florida just at the moment. He went into a uh, restaurant <clears throat> and asked for an orange juice. It was, after all, the orange state, and he was surrounded by orange trees. I'm very sorry, they said. We can't give you one. Our machine has broken down. And they had forgotten how to get the juice out of an orange without the use of a machine. And that reminded me of many, many Christian folks who are surrounded by a wealth of richness in Jesus Christ. But we are often not using that rich resource, rather just living in our Christian experience, taking in from time to time a faint dribble of juice out of our faith. Colossians chapter 2 like the rest of Colossians, is all about Jesus. It's a comprehensive guide to you and to me about our relationship with Him. It provides us with the true foundation for Christian living. It begins in verse 6. You'll know that in spite of what Steve Corkroger said the other evening, the Apostle Paul didn't write the chapter references into the original text. I don't know what college Steve was trained at, but uh, the chapter and verse references came later, later. So Paul didn't write it in four chapters, and we have in this book some very bad chapter divisions. So really chapter 1 ought to end at chapter 2 and verse 5, and chapter 2 ought to begin at verse 6 where we began the reading just now. And it speaks about the way in which our Christian lives take their foundation from Christ. We are founded on Him in verses 6 and 7. The Lord Jesus Christ is the basis, we all know that, of all our Christian faith. Without Him, there is nothing of Christianity left. Christianity is Christ. That seems so obvious, doesn't it? I know that not everybody understands that. I struggled a few years ago from uh, one perspective with the discussion and legislation that was going through Parliament about school assemblies. The wording was that they had to be mainly and broadly Christian. But then people explained it by saying, but you don't have to mention Jesus Christ. Now, I've no idea how you can be even mainly and broadly Christian without mentioning Jesus Christ, for he is the very essence and the very foundation of our faith. That's plain and obvious. And this is where Paul begins. You've received Christ Jesus as your Lord. That Christ Jesus that we were looking at yesterday in chapter 1, verses 15, through to 20. Not a Christ Jesus of your own imagination, of your own invention, of your own creation, but the one whom God has revealed to us. God himself become a human being, the creator of the universe, the sustainer of the universe, the head of the church, the very image of God himself, the one who is destined to reconcile all things. It is that person that you have received as your Lord. That's the basis of your foundation in Christ. But if that's your basis, then you have a need to build on that. How are you going to do it? Well, you're to do it by continuing to live in Him. Your need is not to say, well, that's the elementary principle. Now we go on to something else. 
That's the ABC. But now we learn some more complicated things. That's the non-joined up writing. But when you get past that, you do the joined up writing. No, all that you ever need is to continue to live in him. If it's not in Christ, then it's not necessary because he is the altogether sufficient one. And when they were tempted to turn to other practices and beliefs and to mix and match their religion in ways that are spelled out from verse 16 onwards in this chapter, Paul says to them, forget it. All you need to do is carry on the way that you are with the Lord Jesus Christ. So he presents them with a challenge. You've received him, now continue to live in him. The challenge is be rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. The challenge is indeed you don't need anything else than Jesus, anyone else than Jesus, but you need to go on growing in him. You're rooted in him already. Now be built up in him and established, strengthened in your faith. Just because Jesus is the one and only person you need in your Christian experience doesn't mean to say that you recycle elementary experience time and time and time again. In your relationship with Jesus, there's room for growth and development there is more to him yet than you've experienced, more to him yet than you've understood, more to him yet than you've exploited in your relationship with him. So it's not condemning you to stay spiritual infants. Rather, there is plenty of room for development and maturing. And to make the point, in Paul's typical way, he mixes his metaphors. He's a wonderful person for mixing his metaphors. Within that verse 7, he uses three different metaphors about growth. First of all, an agricultural metaphor. You're rooted in him. And it's worth pausing to say, is that where our roots are as Christians? Are our roots firmly down into Jesus Christ? If not, then maybe that's why some of us are having problems with our Christian faith. If we're actually rooted in other traditions, rooted in our denomination, rooted in particular experiences that we've heard about from others, rooted in some doctrine which may be right but isn't central, rather than rooted in Christ, then of course, if the roots don't go down, the plant won't grow. Now you'd think, having started with an agricultural metaphor like that, about roots, Paul would go on to talk about the plant developing or the tree growing. But no, he mixes his metaphors, moves immediately from talking about an agricultural metaphor to an architectural metaphor, from the farmyard to the building site. Your roots are down, now he says, build a structure, build a building on your roots. Well, we know what he means. Go on growing. Because your roots are down, that's not all. There are things to be built on that in your life. <coughs> As you discover more and more about Jesus, you'll work out more and more the implications of it. It will make more and more sense to you in terms of discipleship. It will claim more and more areas of your life. You'll be understanding your faith more and more so that you'll be more ready to give answers to people. You'll be able to suss out what's going on in your own experience more, seeing it from Jesus' viewpoint. So you need to build on that. And then he says, okay, we've been in the farmyard and we've looked at the agricultural roots. We've gone through the building site. We've seen our need to build on that. So we've seen the architectural illustration. Now come with me to the marketplace. And in the marketplace, what happens? Well, in the marketplace, as people buy things, legal guarantees of sale are given over. Receipts are written so that there is proof of purchase, confirming new ownership. And when Paul says that we need to be strengthened in the faith, as you were taught, it's that illustration he's using. You are <clears throat> the Lord Jesus's. You do belong to him. Now confirm that. 
now give proof of ownership by becoming more and more strong in your faith. And there's one other thing that he wants to say about being founded on Christ. Not only about the basis having received Christ, the need to continue to live in Him, the challenge having been rooted to be built up and strengthened, but how is it going to happen, the manner of it, at the end there of verse 7? The manner is that you are to do this not with grim determination, not so that it is a duty and a chore, but you are to do it with thanksgiving. In fact, you are to be overflowing with thanksgiving. They must have been a miserable lot in Colossae, you know, because six times in this letter he refers to the need to be thankful. Chapter 1, verse 3, verse 12, chapter 2, verse 7 here, chapter 3, verses 15 and 16 and 17, chapter 4 and verse 2, he just underlines the need for thankfulness. Perhaps they suffered from the British disease. You know, we're marvellous moaners and grumblers, aren't we? We look negatively all the time if we can. We always rejoice when we don't win a test match, which is quite frequent because it gives us an opportunity, at least it gives our national press to say how bad we are. And if we do win a one-day match occasionally, well, we find excuses for having done so. And we put ourselves down, and we think negatively a lot of the time. Some years ago, Diane and I moved to a, a new house near Watford, and uh, uh, we were just moving in, and as you do when you move in, you have a tremendous amount of rubbish. So we put out half a dozen black sacks that day at the front gate in the hope when the dustmen came, sorry, the refuse disposal officers came, they'd be able to pick it up and put it in the van. And uh, our neighbour uh, leaned over the fence and said to me, they won't take it, you know. Uh, so I said, well, no matter, Harry, if they don't, uh, doesn't matter. When I come home from work today, uh, I'll then myself put it in the car and take it down the tip, but it would be wonderful if they would. Well, I came home from work that day and they had taken it. And Harry was leaning over the fence and he said, they wouldn't have taken it if you'd lived in Watford, you know. <laughs> Always thinking negatively. But it's a great spiritual discipline to be thankful, overflowing with thanksgiving, because you appreciate all that God has done for you. It puts the rest of life in perspective. And so often we allow these central wonders of the gospel to be eclipsed in our thinking because we're so sucked into groaning about our present experience that we aren't overflowing in thankfulness for all that God has done for us in Christ. So to begin with, he tells us, we are founded on Christ. And then in verse 8, he reminds us of the freedom we have through Christ, freedom through Christ. Just as the sun may be eclipsed sometimes from the moon, by the moon, so it is possible for the glory of Jesus Christ sometimes to be eclipsed by lesser planets, other religions. And that's what's been happening at Colossae. The wonder of all that God has done in Jesus is being eclipsed in their experience as they get sucked into all this mix and match religion. Let me put it another way. There are some people who've grown up in institutions, who've spent more of their life inside Her Majesty's establishments than outside, that when they come to the day of re release, <coughs> they can't quite cope with it. They suffer from gate fever. They don't know how to live in freedom on the outside of the world. They want to go back into the routines of prison. And Paul says, you folks in Colossae are beginning to suffer from gate fever. Rather than enjoying the freedom that you have in Christ, there are some of you who actually are willingly being made captive again. See to it that no one 
takes you captive. Well, who are the potential jailers? Who is it that's going to lock you up and make you captive? And three things are detailed in verse 8 that we need to get our minds around. Firstly, there is deceptive philosophy. Secondly, there is human tradition. And thirdly, there are the basic principles of this world. Now, it's not so easy to disentangle them. They all overlap and one feeds on another. But let's try to understand what he meant by those three potential jailers that take away our liberty in Christ. Deceptive philosophy. He doesn't mean that all philosophy is deceptive or that all philosophy is hollow, empty or a waste of time. Some philosophy may be valuable in helping us to think clearly about the world, our life and our faith. But much philosophy isn't of that character and is deceptive. It sounds brilliant. It sounds very fascinating. It sounds very enticing, very convincing, very persuasive. But actually there's nothing to it. High sounding words, posh arguments that actually don't follow through. The world in which Paul lived was a world where the popular entertainers of the day were wandering philosophers. They didn't have television and news commentators to watch, so they had these wandering philosophers who went throughout the ancient world, standing on street corners and in marketplaces, peddling their wares. We get an insight into that, into the New Testament, in Paul going uh, in Acts chapter 17 to Mars Hill. And there the variety of ideas that were on offer well, Paul says there are people in Colossae who have ideas about how you can know God that are, rather than going to liberate you, they're going to imprison you. And we, in a very different world today, need to be aware of the deceptive philosophies that are around in our world. They may be different, but they still want to take away our liberty in Christ. There's the philosophy of individualism in our world. The individual reigns supreme. The philosophy of rights, me, I, I demand. That's only a sophisticated statement of sin so frequently, of pride and of self-centeredness and of human arrogance. There's the philosophy of relativism. Oh, there is no right, there is no wrong, there are only opinions. And your opinion is as good as anybody else's opinion. You can't choose between them. There is no truth or falsehood in the moral area. No rights or wrongs. Only if that's the way you want to live your life, then you do it. If that's the way somebody else wants to live their life, you do it. Sexual preferences or practice would be just one of many examples in that area. The philosophy of choice. We are addicted to choice in our world, aren't we? We always want to have the right to choose. So we go into our supermarkets and we are confronted with multitudes of breakfast cereals. And if there isn't one the right size, the right shape, the right brand name, the right packet, the right colour, well, we don't have it because we feel we ought to be able to choose. Or there's the philosophy of scientism, not science, which is a useful, maybe even neutral tool, but scientism allied to the philosophy of materialism that says there is nothing beyond what you can see and touch and handle and measure and experiment with. And the material is all. And science has all the answers and technology will solve all our problems. Many are deeply into that. Or there's the philosophy that we're trapped by our past. That you are what your past has made you and you can't do anything about that. You can't be any different. The philosophy of being the victim today. And all these the Christian gospel fundamentally challenges because all of them seem to offer freedom, but don't. They actually trap you. Whereas Jesus Christ 
is the way to true freedom. Well, deceptive philosophy was the first potential jailer. Human tradition was the second. Human tradition was the way in which some of that philosophy, and certainly some of the basic principles we'll look at in a moment, got uh, expressed in the lives of ordinary Christian folks in Colossae. Almost certainly he's talking about religious tradition. And uh, almost certainly it's a reference to Jewish religious tradition. You will know the word synagogue as a, a, a good word which ties up with uh, the Hebrew practice of religion. Well, the word, Greek word that Paul uses here is very similar to that. It's not synagogue, but it's synagogue. And almost certainly he's saying, do you hear the word play? Uh, yes, I'm not actually naming the Jews at this point, but you get it very clearly. It's what's being taught in some of the Jewish synagogues that is actually going to hold you captive. Some of that will have to do with magical traditions and with superstitions. The Jews, we know, at this time were quite superstitious and had a place for magic. Christ has set you free from all these supernatural powers, but these people want to keep you bound, not only by law, but captive to these supernatural powers. You think that by appeasing these supernatural powers, they'll set you free. Far from it. These are the very things that will keep you captive. And that human tradition is spelled out in verse 16 through to 23, to which we'll come in a moment. And then he talks thirdly of the jailer of the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. And this is another problematic phrase or rather word in Paul's writing. And people dispute exactly what he means by basic principles. There are at least seven main interpretations of this word as it comes here and as it's used again in the letter to the Ephesians. So let me tell you the answer rather than go into all the discussion. I'm quite convinced that whatever else it may mean, Paul is referring here to the existence of supernatural powers, of spiritual beings who were very real in the world of Colossae, as they still are for many people in our own world. They exist. Some people have struggled with that because they don't basically have a supernatural worldview, and a lot of the theologians <coughs> have said Paul can't possibly be talking about basic principles in that sense, so they have said what he's actually talking about are the structures and authorities that we see in the government and in the natural world rather than the supernatural world. No, no, that's running away from interpreting the scripture in its original context. Originally, I'm quite sure these basic principles would have been principalities and powers that people experienced as superhuman beings in the supernatural world. They'd have been astral deities. They'd have been demons and demigods. They'd have been Satan and all his angels. They'd have been other angels, some of whom were good, some of whom were not. They'd have been magic spirits who inhabited things. They'd have been the stars that they believed were actually alive and powerful and effective influencing people's lives. That's what he means by the basic principles. And he says that if you go on trying to appease them through your various rituals, then actually you'll be captive. You won't be free in Jesus. Now his approach to them would have been utterly startling. They thought that by offering sacrifices to them, by keeping certain days, by going through certain rituals, by uh, appeasing them in rites, they thought that they'd get protection, that they'd get goodwill, that they'd merit good fortune for the future. Paul is saying, rather than all those things happening, it's quite the reverse. What these supernatural beings are doing 
is imprisoning you and stopping you know, knowing your freedom in Christ rather than protecting you they are in fact depriving you of your freedom now I know and I affirm that these basic principles on the one hand still exist and still are operative today and on the other hand that they often find their expressions through human structures and authorities and earthly things that we don't naturally recognize as being the basic principles these superhuman authorities yes the demonic can work through the natural world uh, as well as working directly so <clears throat> As my friend Nigel Wright puts it, he says this word refers consistently to genuine power realities which are both earthly and heavenly, divine and human, spiritual and political, visible and invisible, may even be good or evil. But the point is that Christ is superior to them all and our freedom comes through him. And it may be that some of you are struggling. Maybe you feel that there is some spiritual influence, demonic activity in your life. I've had people come to me over the years praying, asking me to pray for them that they might have the spirit of uh, fornication exorcised from them. I had a letter just a week or so ago from somebody who asked if I would pray that the demon of smoking would be... Uh, exercised from his life and indeed demons may lie behind such behavior although we grapple as Christians not only with the devil but also with the flesh and the world and sometimes it's too easy to blame the devil for problems that actually lie within our own flesh I wasn't at all convinced in that person who came to me to pray that she might be exercised from the demon of fornication, that it was a demon at all. It was just plain moral disobedience on her part. She hadn't learned to die with Christ and live with him, as we shall see in a moment. The answer in her case lay elsewhere. Sometimes the answers may be exorcism, but often it's actually a fuller understanding of all that Christ has done for us in the cross and simply living by faith in the light of that. As we shall see and that's certainly what Paul is saying to the Colossians so we move from being founded on Christ and having freedom through Christ thirdly to fullness in Christ verses 9 to 12 for in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form Paul bends over backwards to underline this time and time again because no one in Colossae disputed that Jesus was divine but then they thought a lot of other gods were divine. No one doubted that he had some of divinity in him, that he was partly God, but then they thought a lot of other things were partly God. But Paul has to underline and say to them, look, all of God is to be found in him. This is who he is. Look at verse 9 and then on to verse 10. As Eugene Peterson puts it, everything of God gets expressed in him so you can see and hear him clearly. You don't need a telescope, a microscope or a horoscope to realize the fullness of Christ and the emptiness of the universe without him. He is fully divine as well as being fully human and therefore he is unique. He isn't on a par, on a plane with all these other deities and principalities and powers that you spend your life trying to please and trying to gain protection from. He alone is the all-sufficient, the complete answer. There is nothing omitted from Jesus that needs to be added anywhere else. He is all you need. When I was a young man and uh, used to go to uh, what... Uh, uh, was latterly called New Horizons before Spring Harvest. One of the great preachers I used to listen to and benefit from enormously was the great and godly Alan Redpath that some of you will remember. And if I heard Alan Redpath tell a story once, I heard him tell it any number of times uh, towards the end of his ministry. 
uh, about a man who bought a Rolls Royce and uh, exported it and took it overseas and it was the subject of great fascination by people and people wanted to find out when garages got hold of it overseas all the technical data and one of the things that they couldn't find out was what the brake horsepower was and what the engine capacity was of the Rolls Royce so eventually they sent a telegram to Derby and they asked what is the brake horsepower what is the CC of the engine and they got one word back in reply on the telegram it was the word adequate now I told that story recently and I have to confess to you because I'm not particularly like preacher stories that don't ring true I said this sounds like a good preacher story to me I don't believe it will happen it, it happened only to be soundly rebuked by people who had the technical know-how in the congregation that day to tell me that Rolls-Royce never do in fact reveal the brake horsepower or the CC capacity of the engine so maybe they were right maybe Alan's story did ring true and I have to confess I should have believed him and trusted him even more the point was they didn't need to know because everything they could ever encounter that engine was capable of dealing with it was adequate it was sufficient and so it is with you and I in Jesus Christ he is the adequate one now if that is who he is how do we benefit from this fullness in him verses 11 and 12 in him how does it become ours well it doesn't become ours by going through all sorts of rituals or ceremonies by going through the Jewish ceremony of circumcision there mentioned in verse 11 and so belonging to the whole Jewish people that's not the way forward or by offering offerings to all these supernatural powers by appeasing them going through the baths that were associated with initiation into the mystery religions that were practiced there in Colossae you don't discover more of this fullness of Christ in your life by going through outward rituals you do it simply by joining with him by uniting with him by identifying with him you've already been buried with him in baptism that's the one initiation right which is adequate and sufficient if you understand what it means what it what it signifies what happened in that ancient world as people were baptized well they entered the water leaving behind them one set of clothes and one way of life and they were buried in baptism having died to that previous way of life they were buried in water and then they were lifted out of the water and went in a new direction as a new cleansed whole person in Jesus and it's a graphic picture of the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus and what happened to Jesus needs to happen by faith to us not literally but as we come to trust him we too die to our old way of life and leave that behind we are buried to that way of life and in the goodness of God we are given new life in Christ we can begin all over again so as verse 10 says we have fullness of life in Christ and if you're not living a full Christian life it's because you haven't understood Jesus sufficiently you need to go back and explore him more you don't need a fifth sixth seventh super deluxe type version of Christianity that you haven't yet got you need to go back to the one and only all sufficient sufficient answer who is Jesus fourthly we come to some of the most marvelous verses in the New Testament to tell us about forgiveness from Christ verses 13 to 15 the emphasis actually in that last paragraph verses 9 to 12 was not on what we do but on what God has done for us 
having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God, who raised him from the dead. The emphasis is all on what Jesus, what God in Christ has done for us. And Paul now comes to spell that out in marvelous and graphic detail. God makes us new in Christ by forgiving our sins and making us new. We don't need to be trapped by the victim mentality, trapped by our past, whatever it is. <coughs> and to make his point, he uses two very graphic pictures from his world. This forgiveness from Christ has come on the one hand because he has cancelled our debt, verse 14, and on the other because he has defeated our enemies, verse 15. He's cancelled our debt, verse 14. Each of us has signed, whether we know it or not, an I-O-U. We are in debt. We have to say that uh, Di and I sometimes run out of change at home. You know, we use these plastic cards and they only dispense 10 or 20 pound notes these days. And it's sometimes very convenient when inconvenient when you just need a few coins, a few pounds. So what we do is borrow from Richard's pocket money. He's great to have around and I'm so glad I give him pocket money. And when we do that, because he makes sure, he's a canny capitalist this lad, we, he makes sure that we write a note, I owe you two pounds, three pounds, five pounds, whatever it is, and he gets it back. He hasn't yet learned about interest, so he doesn't get it back with interest. Well, just as we are sometimes in debt to our son like that, we are much more seriously in debt to God. And the IOU takes the form of a written code which stands against us. And we're not quite sure what this written code is that was in Paul's mind. It might be the Old Testament law that is the code that we have violated uh, and therefore it stands against us as a witness that we have not lived up to the way in which we should. It might be a written code that uh, people believe the angels kept. People believed that the angels kept record books of rights and wrongs in heaven and so our misdeeds were recorded by them. Well, whichever it is, we know that we are in debt to a holy and righteous God. Sin inevitably costs and the debts are mounting. But the glorious good news is whatever the debt, Christ has cancelled it. The wonder is how he's done it. He's done it by taking that written record of all that we owed and nailing it to his cross. Two pictures may have been in Paul's mind as he wrote those words. The first picture coming from Good Friday itself. You remember as Jesus was nailed himself to the cross, so above his head in typical Roman fashion was nailed the indictment, the reason why he was being crucified. And for Pilate, it was that he was the king of the Jews. And Paul's mind's eye might well have been looking back and capturing that scene and saying what was actually written there, nailed to the cross, was not that he was the king of the Jews, but that you and I owe God a debt because of our sin and that that act of crucifixion, symbolized by the nailing of that indictment to the cross, was cancelling it forever. Or it may have been that he had the much more mundane marketplace illustration in his mind. That as in some places in the ancient world, people came to pay off their debts, so the bill was taken and stuck on a nail. And that was the symbol that it was no longer owed, that it was cancelled. Isn't that marvellous? Wouldn't you love somebody to cancel the debt of your mortgage? Just to write it off. No longer any monthly payments to pay to the bank. The house belongs to you. <laughs> well, you owed a much greater debt than your mortgage. You owed the wonderful debt 
or rather you owed the awful debt of your sin, which has been paid for by the wonderful exchange, as Luther puts it, of the death of Jesus on the cross. So you don't need to pay it off by trying to keep the rules or go through rites or appease spirits or worry about demons or pray to two angels because all your debts are cancelled. You're free. And if that's not enough, the other picture here is marvellous. He not only cancels our debt, verse 14, but he defeats our enemy, verse 15. People still say, oh, but we feel captured. We feel imprisoned. Powers hold us. We don't feel liberated. So Paul holds up for us this most marvelous picture of the Lord Jesus Christ like an ancient Roman general. Do you know what used to happen? When Roman generals won victory in battle, they took home the defeated soldiers and authorities and powers. And they led them through Rome in a victory procession. They stripped them of their power. They took away their weapons. They stripped them of their dignity. They took away their clothes. They held them up as a laughing stock, an object of contempt by the Roman citizens. And Christ says, you know that that happens in our world. Uh, Paul says, you know that that happens in our world. You, you see that happening time and time again. Well, just what a Roman general does, Christ has done for you. So these principalities and powers, the rulers of the world that you think are so strong, actually they're just defeated. They're denuded. They are objects of contempt. Christ has disarmed them and made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. The cross has said it all. The cross has done it all. The amazing thing is the irony which was involved in the cross. For you see, the powers of Rome and of Jerusalem took Jesus, stripped him, nailed him to a cross, and thought that they had defeated him. They got angry at his challenge. So they wanted to get the one up on him. They celebrated their triumph that they had removed him in this shameful, ignominious, humiliating way from the world. But oh, the delicious irony. As Tom Wright puts it, that on the cross what was really happening was that God was stripping them naked, the principalities and the powers. He was holding them up to public contempt and heading the <coughs> them in triumphal procession in Christ. This crucified Messiah was not a mistake, not a defeat, but the very means by which the powers that held people captive were going to be broken and people were set free. The cross means that our freedom is available and the bill of our freedom is signed in nothing less than his blood. So we come to the end of the chapter. If we are to be founded on Christ, if uh, there is freedom available through Christ, if all that we need, fullness, is found in Christ, if forgiveness flows from the cross of Christ for us, then why do we give in to the temptation of falling away from Christ? Which is what he addresses in verses 16 through to 23. In view of all that, why do we need to look elsewhere for other solutions? Why aren't we satisfied? Where, why are we pecking at other forms of religious ceremony? But they do, don't they? The Colossians did, we do. And so he sums it all up by applying it to their situation. And he first of all warns them about seductive alternatives in verses 16 to 18. 
He says, look, they look very good. They tickle your fancy, to be honest. They make you feel good. You're doing something, and, and we all like doing something. We, we feel as though we're making progress, so, so we impose rules about what we eat or drink, or uh, days that are special, what we regard as a religious festival, or new moon celebration, the new moon, because you know astral deities were part of it, or, or a Sabbath day, because there was a Jewish background for some. But these are a shadow of, of things to come, the reality is to be found in Christ. Oh, and, and we get locked into these things, we get into great detail uh, uh, about them, he says. Um, uh, Don't let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you from the prize. Such people go into great detail about what they've seen, and their unspiritual minds puff them up with idle notions. They speculate and they know everything. Oh, but it's all a load of rubbish, actually. You know, we as Christians are very good at doing some of that. We make central what the Bible does not make central. We speculate and work out all sorts of things where God has not yet revealed His will. Those of you who most confidently know all about the ranks and hierarchies of angels and all the ranks and hierarchies of the demonic world, well, you don't get that from Scripture. You may have it all worked out in your mind and you can be very proud about it or about all sorts of other things in your Christian faith if you're not careful, superior to other people because you worked it out and knowledge puffs you up. Hey, but a lot of it, though it may be seductive, is not true faith in Christ. And so he goes on in these verses to not only warn of seductive alternatives but to expose spurious religion. Hey, if Coke is the real thing, when it comes to Christ, when it comes to, 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 to faith, to religion, Jesus is the real thing. Verse 17, the reality is found in Christ. Verse 19, these people who sound so good, who've got all sorts of attractive things to put in front of you, actually, they've lost connection with the head. It's not the genuine stuff they're neither in touch with Christ nor with the Godhead. Verse 23, they have an appearance of religion. Looks convincing, but when you actually examine it, it isn't. I remember years and years ago going to uh, the Niagara Falls and thinking, as I often do on my travels around the world, it might be nice just to take something home to remind me of being at Niagara Falls, something which was authentic that would uh, be a memento of the occasion. Do you know every shop I went in and everything I picked up, when you picked it up and looked at it, it had made in Taiwan, made on the bottom, made in Hong Kong. Nothing seemed authentically to come from that area. It doesn't, does it? And so often we need to pick up and examine carefully the religious opinions that are being said to us. And when we turn them over, we might see that made in Taiwan or made in Hong Kong is stamped all across the bottom of them. They may look good, but they aren't the real thing which is to be found in Jesus alone. So he makes a striking appeal in verse 20 to end with. Since you have died with Christ, to the basic principles of the world. They can't touch you anymore, can't hold you anymore. They are disarmed. They've been shamefaced on the cross by the cross of Christ. They have been held up to public ridicule. So why do you still treat them as if they're important? Why do you still live as though you still belong to them? Do not submit to its rules. Don't give in. Rather, enjoy the freedom for which Christ died. David Watson used to tell a story in explaining the book of Romans, talking about the way in which we die with Jesus Christ, about Mary and Jane Brown of a previous generation who were invited to, quote, a sinful, unquote, party. I have no idea what went on in a sinful party. But since they had recently been converted, they decided that they could not go 
it was best to steer clear. So they sent this RSVP to those who'd invited them. Mary and Jane Brown thank you for the invitation and regret that they cannot come as they died yesterday. <laughs> They'd understood the fundamental change that dying with Christ, being buried with Christ and being raised with him means in our lives. These Colossian Christians hadn't got hold of that yet. They were still living as if they were only half dead, rather than having fully died with Christ and been buried with him and living in the new life. They were living with one foot in both camps still. Oh, but you'll never know freedom in Christ like that. God's longing and God's desire for you is that all the fullness of the life of Christ be your experience. So don't give in to anything that would be second best, that would betray you, that would captivate you. But rather look to the cross of Jesus and all that God has done for you there and believe, trust, live in freedom. Let's pray together. <coughs> we thank you, O oh God, our Father, for your extraordinary grace to us in the Lord Jesus Christ, for the way in which by being himself stripped naked and humiliated, shamefully and painfully put to death on a cross, he cancelled our debt and disarmed every enemy that we could ever face. Now, loving Lord, we pray that we might, with the eye of faith, see Christ and him crucified, Christ and him risen, and experience in our lives all his fullness, not giving in to any lesser principality or power, not pretending that his is not the victory, not giving in to those things which would seek to captivate us, but rather looking them full in the face and declaring that in the cross Christ has set us free. Amen. Let's all stand and we'll, uh, we'll turn to number five. Great Wesleyan hymn that reflects a little of what we...